Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Automation of Organoid Assays Requiring a 3D Matrix with Dragonfly Discovery. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by SPT LabTech. To learn more, visit them at sptlabtech.com. Now we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd now like to welcome our speakers, Hilary Sherman, a senior application scientist at Corning Life Sciences, and Anne Hammerstein from SPT LabTech. Welcome both of you, and you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for this uh, kind introduction. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're delighted to bring this webinar to you today. Um, today's work has really been uh, carried out by two wonderful people, Hilary from uh, Corning, who's uh, speaking and presenting today, as well as my colleague, Holly Hung, who's one of our field application scientists. Um, today, in terms of the structure of today's talk, um, I will begin by giving you a brief introduction around uh, some of the challenges of setting up 3D cell cultures using automation. And I'll also bring you a brief overview of some of the instruments that uh, can be used for this process, and in particular, the dragonfly discovery that has been used for the case study that Hillary will present. Uh, Hillary's case study is called intestinal postcolon induced swelling assay, um, and she will go into some uh, technical details as well as um, scientific results of this case study. And we will conclude today's webinar with um, some question and answers. And as uh, Susie has explained, please keep fielding them as we go along. So we have lots of time to go through them at the end of this presentation. So when we think about setting up 3D cell cultures, uh, there's a number of challenges in particular with regards to automating this process. Uh, when we talk to our customers, uh, we're hearing uh, about a, a desire to increase the throughput of these assays, but that is really limited by the supply of cells and oftentimes precious reagents. There's only so much material available with which we can set up these assays. And um, the materials themselves can be very tricky to handle. Um, materials like Corning's Matrigel require tight temperature control to pipette accurately. And generally, the material is, is quite variable. There's biological variants within there. Um, but there's an added challenge of ensuring there's high uh, homogeneity when using automation to set up these assays. Uh, lots of our customers are also telling us, you know, they would like to use the strongest possible biological model, but of course that comes at a cost. So is there an opportunity to perhaps miniaturize and save reagents and enable more assays from a finite amount of material? Um, I want to tell you, first of all, how some of our instruments are well placed to address these challenges. So if we uh, take a quick look at the next slide, um, at SPT LabTech, we um, use positive displacement pipetting and dispensing as, as the basis of our technology. And we can use this uh, either with low volume liquid handling, as on the left, this is our mosquito liquid handler, setting down droplets of liquid transferring from one plate to another. And the key with positive displacement is really that the liquid is in direct contact with a piston that sits either inside the pipette barrel, as you can see on the left-hand side, or a dispenser syringe, as you can see on the right-hand side. And we, when we transfer liquids, it's really the movement of that piston directly on the liquid that moves the liquid. There is no uh, air cushion involved. There's no uh, system fluid. There's uh, no lines, anything like that. It's really the direct transfer of the liquid. And the big advantage of using this method is that it's suitable for all liquid classes. So from very volatile things like 80% ethanol up to very viscous materials like 80% lithorol, but also jelly-like materials like Corning Matrigel. 
And this method of uh, pipetting and dispensing is extremely accurate, even at the smallest volumes. Um, today's presentation focuses on dispensing using our Dragonfly Discovery instrument. Um, and if we take a look at the next slide. Here we go. Uh, this is our, our Dragonfly, sorry, I just, there we go. This is our Dragonfly Discovery Reagent Dispenser. So this is a small benchtop unit that comes with a choice of either three, six or 10 dispense heads that you can see dispensing on the video on the right hand side. It is a, a non-contact reagent dispenser, so it is not reliant on pipette tips at all. Um, liquid is transferred directly from these uh, stationary tips onto the plate below. And these tips have a, a big dynamic range, starting at just 200 nanoliters right up to 4 ml. So with that, it's possible to really drive down uh, dispense volumes quite aggressively, uh, miniaturize assays, and thereby save uh, precious cells or reagents. Um, and as I said, this is based on positive displacement. Uh, so it's truly liquid class agnostic. We do not have to specify the type of liquid that we do dispense. You can also see that this dispense is very fast. So using six uh, tips, for example, we can fill a 384 well plate in under 30 seconds. If you wanted to really minimize dead volumes, you could uh, fill a 384 well plate in around two minutes. And this method of liquid dispensing delivers outstanding accuracy at low volumes. Um, we can fill any type of plate, starting from 96 or plates right up to 15, 36 or plates. So we, we're compatible with most scales um, of assay. So if I just jump to the next slide. There we go. Just by word of reference, we won't be talking very much about the mosquito liquid handler today, but we have some customers using this instrument for 3D cell culture applications that require contact uh, dispensing or pipetting. The mosquito works a little bit different to the dragonfly discovery. It's a pipette uh, tip based system and each instrument has a reel of pipette tips uh, on the top. You can see a single tip on the right, so that's a polypropylene barrel that is fitted with a single stainless steel piston on the inside, and it's the movement up and down of that piston inside the barrel that moves and transfers liquids. So Mosquito is a liquid handler, so that really allows it to transfer liquids from one plate onto another using a contact dispense. It comes, uh, this instrument, in a range of models. There's a low volume version that can uh, pipette between 25 nanoliters right up to 1.25 microliters or a high volume version uh, that goes from 500 nanoliters up to 5 microliters. Um, the Mosquito LV and Mosquito HV are multi-channel instruments that um, pipette column by column either using 8 or 16 channels. Um, we also have an option of a single channel instrument that allows cherry picking and that's available in either the high or the low volume configuration. Um, Hillary will show you some videos um, of matri gel dispensing uh, shortly, but just to give a flavor of what we can do, the first video that's playing here shows you a single tip dispensing 200 nanoliters of 0.7% matri gel into a 384 well plate, and this is in real time. And probably all you can see is a little air bubble that seems to be forming at the end of the dispense. That's just a little suck back motion to ensure that that matri gel um, dispenses accurately and cleanly into this plate. Um, but the process is extremely fast, it's extremely clean. We are able to dispense more concentrated solutions of matri gel than this, and we can talk about what's possible in the question and answers at the end. Obviously, when dispensing uh, reagents like Matrigel, temperature control is extremely important. So this right-hand side video just shows you we have this uh, passive cooling block that can be put into the freezer prior to setting up the experiment. The reagent reservoir is then placed on top of that, and we can quickly add the Matrigel solution into this reservoir. And that type of setup provides passive cooling for a period of time. Um, we're also working on a passive cooling element that wraps around the syringe. So once that matri gel has been aspirated, it can also stay cool 
in the uh, in the syringe body. Of course, when we're working uh, with cells and precious cells, oftentimes with these 3D assays, it's extremely important to ensure that there is no contamination between cell lines, um, that there's no carryover or anything like that. So all of our instruments uh, work with single-use, high-quality consumables. Uh, we control the production and the supply of these, uh, so we are confident that we can uh, deliver them. For some labs, getting hold of pipette tips is a real issue right now, so that does not affect us. And we are, of course, uh, very certain of the quality of the material that we supply. Our syringes are made from high quality polypropylene, um, the reservoirs from HDPE. So that's really to minimize any passive absorption of materials onto the plastic. Um, we can use a single um, uh, syringe type to address the full uh, dispense volume range. So unlike a pipetting system, perhaps where you're used to having your yellow tip and your blue tip, or, or some systems where you have to change the type of source plate that you can use, that is not the case here. That single tip can really address the full dispense range uh, that is accessible to the instrument. Um, for very large uh, reagent supplies, if someone is really looking at setting up very high throughput assays, on the bottom right you can see a, a pump valve. That's a system that allows us to increase the reagent supply, move away from the open cup reservoirs. In this case, we put a bottle next to the instrument that is fed via peristaltic tubing. And uh, the syringe, the dragonfly syringe, can then take the required amount of material from that valve. Uh, meanwhile, the reagent line continues circulation, so nothing can settle. Um, if you've uh, got any questions about the instrument, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. That is my very brief introduction of the dragonfly uh, instrument done. With that, um, I would uh, like to thank you for this part um, of the presentation and hand over to Hillary. Hillary, over to you, please. Great. Thanks so much, Anne, for setting us up for the next few slides. Okay. So before we dive into the actual application, I just want to give a little bit of a background on organoid cell culture in general. So to start with, there's still some debate as to what is truly defined as an organoid versus a spheroid. Um, but I've compiled here a list of, of what I believe are some of the more commonly accepted criteria. So spheroids in general are more simplistic 3D structures that arise mostly from cell lines or primary cells. Organoids, on the other hand, are generated from stem or progenitor cells and can thus differentiate into multiple cell types that are much more reflective of the organ itself. A spheroid would require multiple cell types to be added in order to have this level of complexity. Additionally, the organoid uh, self-organizes using cues from the ECM around it, um, such as um, ECMs like the Corning Matrigel Matrix. And this allows for cells to be organized in a more similar fashion to how they would be in vivo. With a spheroid, the 3D structure typically does not self-organize. So now that we have a better idea of what an organoid is, let's talk about why organoids are such a valuable model. First and foremost, they better resemble the complexity of the actual tissue they're modeling. When taken from a patient biopsy, they're able to maintain the genetic diversity of the tissue source. And this is really important for understanding tissue complexity and diversity, as well as for the potential to use organoids for personalized medicine. In the case of organoids generated from IPSC or ESC, organoids help us to better understand organoid develop, organ development um, and disease progression as we get a peek into how the organ actually develops. Additionally, organoids can be maintained in culture for long periods of time without genotypic changes. Also, organoid cultures can be initiated from a small amount of input material. This can be iPSC or a biopsy from stem cells, even those found in urine. 
And, and finally, organoids can be modified via CRISPR or other methods more traditionally used for two-dimensional cell culture. So how do you actually make an organoid? As I mentioned in the previous slide, organoids are derived from stem or progenitor cells. And the method used to generate an organoid will depend on the type of organoid and its purpose. Adult stem cell-derived organoids are ideal for personalized medicine or for making organoid libraries. And they're initiated from taking a biopsy that will contain stem cells, such as an intestinal or lung biopsy. These biopsies are then minced or digested, and the cells themselves are embedded in an ECM such as major gel matrix. Over the course of a week or two, organoids will actually start to become visible within the ECM. For organoid models where biopsies are actually not possible, or where a positive and negative control organoid from the same patient might be desired, it might make more sense to generate organoids from pluripotent stem cells. Here, organoids are derived from IPFC or EF cells collected from you know, typical methods of, of generating those cells. And the pluripotent stem cells are then differentiated towards the organoid of interest via several stages of media exchanges over what typically takes multiple weeks. The final differentiation step is where the 3D structures are actually embedded in major gel in order to generate the organoid. Because of the differentiation process involved with PSC-derived organoids, the resulting organoid can form with more of the cells associated with the in vivo environment, such as a mesenchymal niche with intestinal cells. These associated cells may or may not be present with adult stem cell-derived organoids. I mentioned that ECMs such as Matrigel are required for organoid culture. And for those of you who have not worked with Matrigel Matrix before, it's a basement membrane prep that's somewhat of a viscous liquid when it's cold, and it polymerizes to form a gel as it warms up. And the unique temperature properties of major gel allow for fully encapsulating cells or creating complex structures. But it can also make it a bit tricky to work with, um, like Anne alluded to. One of the most important considerations when working with major gel is to keep everything cold. So pre-chill everything that will come in contact with the major gel so that it doesn't start to polymer polymerize prematurely. Um, that means that every tip, every plate, every what reservoir needs to be pre-chilled um, in order to keep the matrix gel nice and cold. In the case of using the Dragonfly Discovery, that meant pre-chilling the syringe-based tips and also using a cold block in order to keep the reagent reservoir nice and cold. In terms of matrix gel matrix, there are different formulations depending on the application um, since we're working with intestinal organoids, we use matrix gel for organoid culture. This particular formulation has been optimized to have a protein concentration range that's much more specific for organoid cell culture. Additionally, each lot is tested in order to be able to form and maintain a stable dome, which is one of the more commonly used methods for organoid culture, and I'll describe that in the next slide. So as I mentioned, um, you know, dome culture is one of the more common methods for culturing organoids, but there are lots of other methods that are used as well, and the method you choose will be dependent on the, the type of application. So the image and the schematic on the left demonstrate what's referred to as an embedded culture. This is where the cells are mixed with the ECM prior to dispensing, and typically um, the well is fully, fully of the matrix gel and, and cell suspension. The result is a gel in which the 3D structures will form throughout the gel. And you can see that in the image, some of the structures are in focus while other structures are, are out of focus, and that's because the structures are actually at different focal heights. Now, this is an easy way to create 3D structures for a homogenous assay or if you're just trying to bulk produce spheroids. But if you want to do imaging, this method is not really ideal because it would result in really long scan times due to the instrument having to focus on so many different focal planes. The sandwich method in the middle is better suited to imaging assays, as you can see from the image in the cartoon. 
um, the cells are much more in focus and sitting in, in a more singular um, uniform plane. And this is because the matrigel is added to the plate and allowed to polymerize before the cells are then added on top. And then finally, the last method shown all the way to the right demonstrates what I am referring to with the dome culture. Here, small droplets of matrigel and cells are mixed together and dispensed into the microplate, creating three to 10 microliter domes in size. And the result is an embedded culture, but in a much narrower focal plane that also doesn't require a lot of material to work with. And so this is the method that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation, um, because it's the method that we used in our actual uh, application. All right, so now that we have some background, let's actually talk about the organoid application um, that Holly and I automated with the Dragonfly Discovery. So the model that we chose to automate is a forskolin-induced swelling assay for studying cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a devastating disease in which mutations in the CFTR gene result in poor regulation of chloride ions into and out of the cells. And this ultimately causes poor regulation of fluids in the cells um, that, that contain these CFTR channels, such as the lungs and the intestine. Individuals with cystic fibrosis produce abnormal amounts of mucus, sweat, saliva, tears, and digestive enzymes. The forskolin induced swelling assay that we're going to talk about is actually one of the first examples of a functional assay that could be accomplished with organoids. So it's a really important application. And it was found that intestinal biopsies could actually be used to grow organoids as a model to study cystic fibrosis, um, and, and as well as CFTR function and potential treatments for this disease. So the assay that was developed starts with making three to five microliter droplets or domes of matrigel and intestinal organoids onto plates and then exposing them to compounds in order to measure the fluid transport. So the image that you're looking on the left is a typical dome containing many healthy intestinal organoids. So you can see those um, sort of empty balloon looking structures. Each one of those is an intestinal organoid. So for maintenance of culture and scale up, I typically make domes um, multiple domes per well um, in, a, in a multiple well plate, such as a 24 well plate. And you can see a representative um, image exampling that um, on the right, where you see multiple domes or multiple droplets in each well. Okay, so I'm hoping these videos are going to work here. Um, it looks like they're working on my screen. Um, so for the actual functional assay, the organoids are exposed to forskolin to initiate a swelling response. And the videos that you're looking at here correspond with fluorescently stained intestinal organoids that have been stimulated with forskolin. Now the healthy organoids are on the left, and what hopefully you can see is that the organoids themselves increase in size over time. Okay, and so this is what would be more of a typical response for a healthy organoid that has been stimulated with forskolin. Now, the image on the right are cystic fibrosis organoids, and hopefully what you can see there is that the organoids themselves are not really increasing in size over time, and that's because of mutations of the CFTR gene. So this change in organized size can then actually be quantified with a high content imager or some other kind of image analysis software such as ImageJ. Now these domes are typically made by hand pipetting, which as you can probably imagine is not really ideal for high throughput applications as it's fairly labor intensive and can result in a high degree of variability. Okay, so um, here's the overall workflow that we followed for our assay. First, the organoids are scaled up in order to actually have enough for the assay. So this was done in 24 um, well um, microplates. And um, then the organoids are actually uh, broken up into smaller pieces by forcefully pipetting with a small pipette tip or a 20 gauge needle. 
And then the organoid pieces are then actually mixed with matrigel to a final concentration between 4.5 and 5.5 mg per mil. And then they're dispensed with the dragonfly discovery. The domes dispensed were at three microliters in size and were distributed to each well of a pre-warmed 96 well plate. For dome assays, we actually pre-warm the plate to 37 degrees before dispensing so that the dome sets up quickly. After overnight culture, we then use the dragonfly discovery to add calcium AM to fluorescently label the organoids in order to make the imaging easier. After about 30 minutes, the medium is then removed and the dragonfly was used to add media with or without compounds, as well as our force colon for stimulation. And um, the organoids were then continuously imaged every 10 minutes for 60 minutes in order to monitor the swelling. Okay, so currently there are, as I mentioned, limited tools for accurately dispensing small droplets of matrix gel and organoids precisely into the center of microplate wells. For high throughput applications, it's really important that the domes are consistent in size and location um, within each well. Since this is an imaging assay, the scan times would be drastically increased if the domes are not consistently placed in each well. And so the Dragonfly Discovery had no problem dispensing the matrix gel droplets as it uses a syringe-based tip that works extremely well for viscous solutions. Um, we dispensed a single three microliter droplet into the center of each well of a 96 well microplate. We also had really good success with dispensing into 3D4 well microplates, which I'm hoping you guys are watching um, with the video on the screen here. So what you're seeing here is a 96 well plate with a single three microliter droplet of human intestinal organoids dispensed into each well by the dragonfly discovery. After 24 hours, organoids were stained with calcium AM and imaged using our high content imager. The image on the right is one well zoomed in close so that you can actually make out the individual organoids. You can see that one field of view was able to capture the stained dome. Um, which are consistent in size, shape, and location. And the fact that you can use one field of view with your image, imager to capture the organoid um, dome and that it's in the same place in every well every time makes for much faster scanning, which is extremely important for high throughput applications. So before actually running our assay, we first wanted to confirm that we could consistently dispense the same number of organoids across a 96 well plate. Organoid pieces are much heavier than single cells, so we were concerned that we might be um, getting some settling, which could increase the variability in our assay. The data here shows that we achieved CVs of less than 18% for each of three plates tested. So this gave us confidence that we could dispense the same number of organoids in each well across the plate and wouldn't have any settling that could impact um, our assay. So one of the aspects that makes cystic fibrosis so difficult um, to treat is the fact that there are many possible mutations of the CFTR gene that can result in cystic fibrosis of varying severity. So this also means that there's not currently a single treatment that will work for everyone. So here we're comparing multiple drugs or combinations of drugs in order to see the impact on organoid swelling. You're looking at a representative dome at time zero and time 60 minutes after force cleanse stimulation using various compounds. You may be able to visually see the increased swelling with the healthy organoids at time 60 versus time zero, but the other images might be a little harder to assess by eye, which is why we use imaging software in order to actually do this analysis. So here are the results from the actual high content analysis of the organoids. You can see that the CF swelling response in blue is much lower than that of the healthy control. Additionally, the CF organoids treated with drug VX809 
had a somewhat increased response, so a little bit of improved swelling, uh, but still not, not as much as uh, what a typical healthy response should look like. The, the gray line is drug VX770, which actually elicited a very large improvement in the swelling response. And then finally, the combination of the two drugs, which is often the case for cystic fibrosis patients, um, resulted in the largest response for this particular organized line. So one of the things that this assay demonstrates is, is really the merit of a personalized approach in order to find the best outcome for a patient. So I just want to thank you so much for your time today. And at this point, we'd be happy to take any questions that, that you might have. Thank you. And thank you so much, Anne and Hillary, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started because we have some great questions already coming in. Our first question is, you mentioned that you have tried dispensing domes into 384 well plates. What volume did you use per well? Yeah, so I can take that one. Um, so I think what we ultimately decided worked pretty well was around 250 um, uh, nanoliters. Um, to make a dome that would stand tall enough, give us enough of a, of a sample to, to image, and, and not touch the edges of the 3D4 well. Thank you so much. And how long does it take to dispense in all 96 wells? Gosh, it was really fast. It was definitely less than a minute. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to add there. Um, it will take uh, around about a minute. It always depends, of course, how many of the uh, dispense heads are used simultaneously. But I think in that single dispense head setup that you describe, about a minute sounds sounds right. Uh, using multiple heads, um, it would be even faster than that. But I think that would only be applicable in, in very high throughput scenarios um, where you really want to fill multiple plates very, very rapidly. Thank you, so, thank you so much. And I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Now, how long did the domes polymerize for, before adding medium? Yeah, that's a great question and, and a really good point that when you run these assays, um, you do have to let the dome fully polymerize before you come back and add cell culture media. Um, so I would say for, uh, for domes that are three microliters in size, um, 15 minutes is, is plenty of time to allow that um, full polymerization to occur. Thank you so much. What is the dead volume of the reservoir you used? So I can probably answer this one. Um, so for applications such as 3D cell cultures using Matrigel, uh, we recommend the use of a low dead volume reservoir, and that carries a dead volume of just 30 microliters. Uh, we obviously recognize that these assays use uh, very precious reagents and cells. You know, if it's patient-derived cells, uh, as in these models, then we, we can't afford to waste any in tubing. Um, so with positive dissection, we we can aspirate almost all of the material out of this low dead volume reservoir and dispense all of that into the plate. So the dead volume that we carry is around 30 microliters. And that is simply required to ensure that there's good wetting of the plunger that sits inside the syringe. So there's no air bubbles or so on to ensure the dispense accuracy. That's where that comes from. Thank you very much. We have time for a few more questions. How do you shear your organoids? Yeah, great question. Um, and and I, some of this does come down to preference and, um, you know, the cell line themselves, different organoids like sort of different treatments. 
Um, I have had the most success using a 20 gauge needle, blunt needle, um, attached to a 1 ml syringe. But I also know um, some people who really just like to use a pipette tip, you know, either um, a P10 tip on top of a P200 tip or a P200 tip in order to, to shear their organoids. Thank you very much. Now, can you keep the plate warm or cold during dispensing? Yeah, I may take this one. So we Great. have currently uh, no active warming or cooling option for the deck. Having said that, as Hillary explained, she pre-warmed the plate in the incubator before putting it into the dispense nest. And then because the dispense itself is so fast, you know, about a minute for a 96 volt plate, that time frame does not cause a significant fluctuation in the temperature of that plate. So as long as it's uh, placed quickly and removed quickly, there isn't actually any need uh, to have active control of the temperature on that plate. I did mention we do have options to cool the reagents, which will sit on the reagent tray potentially for longer. And we're also working on temperature control of the syringe itself. Great question. All of these questions are wonderful. And I want to thank our audience again. Our next question from an audience member, have you characterized intestinal organoids and what data or parameters do you use? Yeah, so we did not characterize the intestinal organoids in this particular paper because we were really just looking at the response. Uh, but, but we have in the past, and actually there are some publications on the Corning website where we've done some intestinal organoid uh, characterization. Um, gosh, off the top of my head, I know we looked at, um, at mucus production and um, LGR5 and, um, gosh, I'm blanking on some of the rest, but um, I could, uh, if you want to provide your email address, I could send you the paper we have with all of those details. Thank you so much. We have one more question from our audience. Does programming software account for the dead volume to put in the reservoirs? Uh, yeah, I can take this one. It, it absolutely does. So our software is really uh, written with usability in mind. So as a user, you would simply uh, write the dispense volume per well that you want to achieve, uh, write the number into the software so you can have any uh, number really. We're not limited to steps of 200 nanoliters. Um, you select the wells that you want to fit. Uh, fill and how many syringes you want to do that and what type of reservoir you have and the software calculates automatically how much reagent you have to lay out to the nearest microliter um, and that takes into account any dead volume. Um, so it's, it's really designed to be simple. Um, the only other parameter as a user you would have to specify is the plate type that you're going into. But again, um, being a non-contact dispense, the system is very tolerant of plate type. So getting getting up and running is really, really easy. I want to thank you, Anne, and thank you, Hillary, for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our audience before we go? Sure. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to listen in today. Um, I hope you found today's session informative. Uh, Hillary and I are available to answer any uh, questions that you may have. Um, I think the best contact on the SPT lab tech side is uh, either through the dialogue, which I think will keep open, or discover at sptlabtech.com. Uh, Hillary, um, over to you. Sure. Um, I guess the, the one comment that I would make is that, um, you know, this is just sort of a proof of concept of how you could use the, um, the Dragonfly for a particular application. But the other methods of, of doing matrix gel 3D assays that I described previously, the sandwich and the embedded, could also be used with the Dragonfly. So um, certainly keep that in mind. Absolutely. We're really open to different uh, formats of assay. Um, if you have any particular ideas, get in touch with us and we'll figure out how we can best support your application. 
I want to thank you again, Anne, Hillary, for your time and for your important research. And before we go, I also want to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, SPT Lab Tech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions and questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thank you for joining us. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.